entrepreneur, jet pilot, peak performance coach, and best-selling author brings you Living Outside the Cube, where great thinkers and doers of our century talk about how to help you be your best. Here is your host, Fabrizio Poli. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to another great episode of Living Outside the Cube. Today, we are connected with Richard Wilson in Miami. Richard is the CEO of the Miami Family Office and also the author of the number one bestseller for, for uh, books about family offices, which is the Single Family Office. Uh, it's a great book and great information. So, Richard, thank you for being on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. So, Richard, tell us a bit about how you started your career and how your journey took you into doing what you're doing today. Sure. Um, really, it started in me being very entrepreneurial uh, growing up. I'd started three or four businesses before I got out of high school. And then when I actually got out of college, I sold a small you know, textbook business I had online to some other students. And I looked around at what to do. And ended up getting hired doing risk consulting for publicly traded companies like Daniel Chrysler and Pacific Corp Energy Company. And while that paid for my MBA, you know, risk consulting is about as exciting as it sounds. It's not the most um, you know challenging work. Sometimes it's about accounting controls and mitigating risk. And so after that, I looked around and I asked myself, you know, where could I work where I would be compensated based on my true value and not how old I am. Mm -hmm. And so I looked at commercial real estate, and I looked at hedge funds, capital raising, kind of the, the Wall Street capital markets world. And after getting a couple of job offers on the commercial real estate side, I decided, you know, I moved to Boston and work in capital raising. And as I did that, I found that within the wealth management statement, there's a group called family offices. Mm -hmm. But the challenge was I wanted to raise more capital from them, but I didn't really know how they operated, how they wanted to be met with, how even to get their contact details. So I set out on a mission to, instead of raising capital from everybody in wealth management, focus on the top, you know, 0.1% of those with 20 million or 100 million or billion dollars of wealth and more. And what I did was create the first website that was a public resource for anybody that wants to learn more about the industry. Uh, we bought familyoffices.com, started writing once a week on there. Mm -hmm. And then the website uh, took off and we got 500 hits, 1,000 hits a day. And we basically... Uh, through my own initially selfish need of just wanting to raise more capital from family offices, ended up creating a great resource for the industry. And um, from there, everything took off from training programs and conferences, data research, investment banking, and executive search. And we have a multi-part business all focused on the family office industry now. Yeah, so what brought you to move from Boston to Miami? Uh, well, I had actually started the business in Boston, and but since I had grown up in Portland, Oregon, I moved back there, uh, married my now wife, um, had our first kid, grew the team, we grew to 10 professionals, and I realized that after being in Oregon for eight years, I'd met two family offices, and I'd go to Monaco to speak at a conference, and I'd meet a dozen, I'd go to Singapore, I'd go to all these different places to speak at conferences, and I'd meet them much more easily than where I was yeah. And so I looked around and looked at moving to Monaco, Singapore, Cayman Islands, and Miami. Um, all would be tax uh, beneficial moves, plus better for ultra wealthy communities. Yeah. And Miami was the best for, for me. You know, we had a lot of US based clients. And we just wanted uh, zero state taxes, uh, you know, admittedly better weather. Um, so, like being okay. outside, yeah. uh, being healthy. Uh, so, that, that was basically a lot of the reasons. You know, Miami is a top seven ultra wealthy location uh globally and inside of the united states i believe only new york trumps it i think miami is always competing with san francisco uh perhaps houston chicago for that second place or third place as the best place to do business for family offices so that was really the main reason so wh why is miami become like the hub for family offices because this i've been reading about this lately and, and it seems like mm -hmm. everything's shifting like from switzerland where they used to be um down to to miami what's causing this shift do you think yeah there's really three reasons i think one is that if somebody becomes wealthy and they realize okay i don't need to struggle to make my first million dollars or ten million dollars let me kind of redesign my life a little bit or see what my real priorities are here and they look around and they want to stay in the United States, then they might say to themselves, okay, well, let's reduce my tax burden. What states does that narrow me down to? And pretty quickly, 
you're looking at either a business-friendly state like Arizona or you're looking at Texas and Nevada and Florida. Um, a lot of people are more familiar with Florida. They're the vacation they are growing up. Yeah. You know, it's a quick two-and-a-half, three-hour flight up to New York where, you know, a lot of people who created wealth yeah. uh, are in New York, so easy to access. And, you know, it gets narrowed down pretty quickly if you consider taxes and enjoyable weather and access to New York. You know, um, it rules out Nevada, at least it did for us, because of because of uh, weather and access to New York. I think the second reason is that a lot of New Yorkers and business professionals, traders from Chicago, um, people from the Northeast in general, Connecticut, who have a lot of money, either come down to Florida several times a year, to Miami, to golf, yeah. to visit clients, maybe to stay there for... 51% of the year just so they qualify for, for taxation purposes. Yeah. I think that's the second reason people are coming down. It's just for business and enjoyment and um, maybe the tax benefits, but just because it's a nice second place to go outside of their home in the Northeast during the cold months. And then I think the third reason is really the flood of capital leaving countries where the government is not trusted, uh, places such as Brazil, Colombia, Venezuela, in Key Biscayne, which is an island right outside Miami where I live, uh, we're 12 minutes from downtown, and it's obviously it's in the United States, but almost nobody here speaks English. There, um, when you go to the grocery store, people speak in Spanish. I had trouble the other day asking somebody where the milk was, and they didn't know what I was saying when I said the word milk five times. <laughs> so I have to, uh, you know, pick up my Spanish skills here. So it's about 8% Brazilian, um, probably 80% Spanish speaking. Um, you know, Brazilian Portuguese is about 8%. I think English is probably 5 or 7% yeah. uh, first language spoken here. So I think that the foreign wealth is really pouring into Miami, and there's lots of statistics about the amount of condos and houses paid for just in cash and families just wanting to park their capital uh, here in Miami or keep this game just to get it out of their country. And whether it's to buy a visa or a green card, yeah. you know, to stay here, if not, they just want to get it somewhere else. Yeah, because this has only happened the last three or four years where Miami started to really become the, the, the family office hub of the world. Before that... It, I think so. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's been picking up steam for sure. Um, I think, you know, in the last three or five years, we're getting more press and more critical mass, and I think it's going to continue to do so. I don't think, I don't see it slowing down at all. I mean, right now, we're not in a great global recession like we were in 2008, and I think that every time that that happens it's going to bring even more capital uh, to Miami because the U.S. is typically a strong, um, you know, one of the stronger players, you know, helping drive out of a recession. And I think that families are going to want to come here for business opportunities and protection from their own government and inflation, et cetera. Yeah, I guess Miami is also a big attractive factor for, for people from South America because being there, a lot of a big Latino community. So even if they don't speak English, right. they can get around because everyone's yeah. Spanish. Yeah, it's kind of self-reinforcing. You know, up Sunny Isles area, there's a lot of Russian families. Yeah. And South Beach is probably the most expensive mix. Uh, you know, racially, there's a lot from Eastern Europe and London uh, and South Beach, or in Cuba's game. Uh, you don't see anyone here from Asia, nobody here from Eastern Europe, really. I knew one couple, and they moved away last month. Um, it's really different pockets depending on the community within the Miami area where Brickell is a lot of bankers and, you know, a lot of people with Hispanic connections, uh, Latin American connections, but, um, you know, different different neighborhoods have different concentrations for sure. So have the Chinese got there yet or not yet? Um, well, definitely. I'm sure there's statistics on the percentage. I don't know off the top of my head, but they haven't. Uh, you know, made a name for a large community part of downtown Miami, at least. At least yeah, they not. tend to be over yeah. on the west coast of the U.S., don't they? They tend to be San Francisco, yeah. Vancouver, that area. Yeah, perhaps more in uh, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm Beach. So far, I haven't found a large community of them here, but I know there are some here. There was one at a wealth management conference I was at last week, you know, a wealthy Chinese family, but not very many. Yeah. So let's get into your book then. Why did you write your book? Sure. And tell us a bit about what, what it, what, who's, it, who's it for? Sure. Well, our whole business model has been to give away as much value as possible um, so that the business comes to us. And that might sound like cliche and everyone says, oh, yeah, we're just trying to add value. But really, uh, we take it to an extreme and we're com very competitive 
on being as genuinely valuable as possible and very prolific. And so it's not just something we say, it's really core to our whole business model. So we've written uh, 3,000 blog posts, we've produced 1,284 videos, we've done 240 audio interviews uh, recorded over the phone or over Skype, our YouTube channel, you know, say we've got a podcast, et cetera. So we're really serious about doing that. And when we looked around at the success of our first book on family offices, uh, published here Wiley, we said, okay, what would be, would be the next step? And we saw that there was never a book written that even had the word single family office in the name of it. And a, a family office, just everybody knows, is just a holistic, full balance sheet wealth management solution for an individual mm -hmm. or a group of individuals and clients. And if it's a single family office, it's just for one individual or one family. If it's a multifamily office, it has two clients, 10 clients. Mm -hmm. The largest of multifamily offices have 100 or more clients. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what I saw was that the family office industry in general was finally getting recognized, at least by the finance community. Yet the single family office niche within that was really ignored. These families don't speak to each other very often. They don't go to conferences too often. Many of them don't have websites or do any branding or marketing or positioning. And so I wanted to shine a light on that area based on my experience of meeting with about a thousand of those single family offices and having contracts in place with many of them. So we had bought singlefamilyoffices.com and we had a book outline to do this and we just decided we were going to you know, interview 30 single family offices, put our experience in the book, and just try to create uh, a very thorough, you know, 300 plus page resource on this industry because it seems like a, a crime that no one had before. I mean, it's a, a valuable market to be serving, and these families need help. So um, it was just kind of ine inevitable that we would create that resource long term, I think. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Over the last five to six years, this whole family office thing, it's almost like financial advisors don't exist anymore now. It's the family office. They look after the yacht, the plane, and uh, the houses and, 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 and everything that they have, as well as their investments. And it kind of makes sense to do it through one right. one organization. So what, what kind of trends have you seen in, in the family office industry over the last few years? And what do you think we're going to see in the, in, the, in the next few years ahead of us? Sure. Um, one thing I've seen is that they're making the headlines more often. Uh, mm -hmm. Today, Bloomberg released an article examining the wealth of Queen Elizabeth, and um, it was talking about family offices and the family office industry and typical returns of a family office versus uh, the Queen. And I think that the word family office being in the news more and more often is important to the growth of the industry because most yeah. people don't know what a family office is. Yeah. Uh, some people who, don't, who work in wealth management don't even know what a family office is. So you can imagine somebody, you know, in London running a manufacturing business, you know, just outside the city or a mineral rights owner in Texas might have no idea what a family office is. So I think that's really important and we're trying to, to drive that trend. I think another trend is that right now, and one thing we're going to see in the future is right now almost no single family offices do any branding or positioning or marketing. The only ones that do are the ones forced to, like a Richard Branson, uh, you know, or Bill Gates or someone such as that is in the limelight all of the time already. Yeah. So they have to kind of manage the chaos that's coming towards them and manage that image perception. Yeah. But I think that um, I was engaged just about six weeks ago for a single family office and part of the value that they want me to bring to the table is helping them with branding and positioning while protecting the privacy of their single family office. So the whole trend of family office public relations, family office marketing for single family offices is really not even started yet, but it's going to be a huge thing in the future because the problem is that all these single family offices complain that they get no access to quality deal flow. Nobody is coming to them with the real estate deal first or the off-market business for sale. Yeah. But at the same time, they don't have a website, they don't go to conferences, they don't have business cards, most of them don't. And they don't really manage their brand or do press releases or even interviews with the press. And so I think that is going to be changing. And we are speaking to several single family offices right now. We, we engaged one for this purpose, but in helping them orchestrate that, because if you can be one of the first movers and be one of the better known single family offices in your local community or your industry, you're going to get access to deals faster and more often than your competition. Mm -hmm. And I think what's critical for families who are conducting direct investments and getting into investment banking and acquiring businesses or real estate is just to know that if you only see 100 deals a year, which might sound like a lot, but it's really not, you need to be seeing that many at least per month. Uh, if you only see 100 deals per year, your top 1% of deals 
uh, it's going to be one deal to choose from, and that 1% may or may not be excellent. But if you see 1,000 deals a year, then your top 1% of deals are going to be much better. You're going to have your pick from those deals. You're more likely to find one where you can either negotiate down the fees or come in at a lower cost basis or find something more aligned with where you're geographically based so you can manage that asset more easily. So really, families are better off getting access to 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 deals a year rather than 100 or 10 deals a year, you know, the chances they're going to do well are very poor in those cases. So eventually, you know, this education trend is going to connect with, you know, the management of an image of a single family office. And I think that's going to help a lot of families and help protect their capital by being more public and getting access to more deals. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, it's interesting when you're saying that uh, a lot of these people are not open, so they're difficult to get hold of, and so they complain. Well, no one's bringing me a deal. But you know, if you can't, if you, someone can't find you online, then I mean, right. it's so important. So, how do you think social media is changing the way these high net worth individuals do business and the ultra high net worths well, as well? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I have a lot of people who are a little bit more senior than me uh, in the industry, whether it's asset management or family offices. And there's two really interesting things that they say. One is they say, these types of families, quote unquote, don't network or do business through social media or respond to email marketing or respond to online marketing campaigns. They only work through referrals. Um, that is false because the trust of the referral has to be earned from somewhere and start from somewhere. And we've used LinkedIn. Uh, books on Amazon, you know, our websites, et cetera, to build that initial trust, whether it's with a CPA, trust yeah. in a state advisor, a uh, smaller family office, and then they refer us to other family offices they're in business with. So you can get that seed of a referral earned through value provided, you know, on social media or online. The other thing that I hear a lot of people say is that um, in this space, you need to have the right database of family offices to call on. Uh, and people are worried about, oh, I don't have the contact details for a family. I wish I just had the right contact details. Mm -hmm. But the problem is the exact conversation I had on um, Friday last week with a large private bank trying to, to penetrate the family office area. Their problem is a lot greater than that. Their problem is not, not having the right database. The problem is even with the right database, these families aren't going to respond to a phone call or an email because things do typically work either on referral or they work because the family has sought out a resource. And if they're looking for an international tax attorney this week, and that is important to them this week, and they look online for one locally to meet with or two to interview, yeah. then that's important to them, and they're going to want to engage with that group. But if they were looking last month or last year, not looking right now, they're not going to respond to the phone call or email typically from that international tax attorney unless he's introduced by a client or a family they know very well. So I think that... Luckily, our business model, you know, it had to be built the way we did because I started with with no capital invested and uh, no real partners backing me. So I had to start with thought leadership because I had no money to spend on advertising. But luckily, that is the way that families like to operate. They like to find people and reach out to them. They don't want to be reached out to and cold called and pitched and have somebody else's agenda pushed on them. Yeah. And so what we try to do is, what we've tried to do is build a diversified family office platform business so that we have, you know, executive search, conferences, our family office database, um, we have some investment banking, single family office management services, et cetera. And the strength of that is not that we're always trying to sell everybody, it's the opposite, is that we just provide thought leadership and value. And, you know, say I'm having lunch with a family that has over a thousand, you know, apartment building units and when I meet with them, it's not about selling them on anything. It's just listening really carefully. And if they want an introduction to another family, I make that. I would say don't charge for for that. It's just building a goodwill. But if they say, oh, we need to hire a couple executives for this operating business we own, or we need help with an M&A transaction, or we need help formalizing our single family office, then we have people on our team that specialize in that, and we've done it before for, for other clients. So it makes us very an ability to respond to that families versus um you know trying to sell them on a lot of different things yeah so basically what you're saying is that you you're not hunting you're fishing 
So right. you're, you're putting information out there and then they're coming to you. They're coming into the net instead of you knocking on door, making cold calls, sending out emails to like a thousand family offices around the world. You're just sending out and sharing valuable yeah. information so that they come to you. We're doing the same thing with, with aircraft sales. Um, we do a lot of blogging right. and, on LinkedIn in particular. And when we shifted the platform, well, we still do Blogger because that helps with Google searches, but we get more interaction from LinkedIn sure. and the phone calls come in and that. We tried, you know, the usual advertising and cold calling, and that, but that, that doesn't work. As you said, you, you've got to right. put the information out there and let them come to you. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think that um, the most shocking statistic is that our most valuable uh, client is a, a billionaire family or a billionaire family office client. And out of the 71 billionaire families we know, uh, we approached three of them, uh, and 68 of them approached us and cold called us and emailed us. And uh, this morning we were contacted by a, a family in India that hasn't disclosed their level of wealth yet, but it's in the hundreds of millions, if not a billion plus. And it's uh, something that happens about every three weeks that one of them reaches out. And I think that that is something that people should take to heart no matter what industry they're in. If somebody comes to you, because I already know who you are and I got value, information, yeah. I'd be qualified to be doing business with you. And I find it's just a good way to do business, and you can build some great niche marketing positioning by building up resources on a very specific topic. Um, and you can do so more quickly than your competition if you're very focused. Yeah, so what, what do you find drives more traffic to you? Is it the videos or the blogging? Um, I find that the blogging long term uh, has produced a higher percentage of the traffic, but I would say that those that take the time to watch the videos or come to a live conference really connect up I think, with more the, the brand more, and everything becomes more real. Otherwise, you know, you read a lot of articles, but people spend a lot less time watching videos. Yeah. So one trick that we've used that works really well is having a lot of our articles linked to a video. We send out a PDF newsletter, we embed a video or link to one. Yeah. LinkedIn, we send out a lot of videos, and even in our books, like the Single Family Office book, one reason it's so popular is that we embedded 40 video modules in the book for free, as well as the 30 inter interviews, and really what we try to do is create a $1,000 training program in Single Family Offices within a, like a $7 book, and I think that anyone who's putting together a niche marketing campaign or program, I would definitely encourage you to combine video and text. And anywhere you have text, also just link to a helpful video. And once you've recorded a bunch of videos, it's actually, you know, I think easier than writing an article. You know, if you know your stuff, then you can always, you know, slice a topic a different way or just provide a perspective from a client meeting you had, mm -hmm. you know, that way, something of that nature is something I'm sure you found. So when you say video, how long do you think the videos need to be? Because there's a lot of debate about 10 minutes, 3 minutes, 2 minutes, 1 minute. Yeah, I think really short videos. Uh, for me, it's hard to get a point across in one minute too often. Yeah. But uh, for me, kind of the sweet spot is probably two and a half to five, two and a half to seven minutes. Uh, any longer than that, and it starts to feel a little bit long-winded, and it probably should have been two videos. Yeah. Um, it have to be a really deep topic I'm trying to cover, and some, you know, kind of an outlier. But most of our videos try to keep real short. And I think importantly, most of them I just shoot on my iPhone. And uh, well. Some of my competition might say, oh, yeah, you know, the audio quality is so bad in some of Richard's videos. Well, the truth is I've got 20 times more videos than they do, and that's part of the cost of doing it is that I don't stress over the production. You know, maybe, you know, the audio quality, I think, is something important to constantly be watching and improving and be aware of sirens and wind and things of that nature. But in general, I'm just trying to get the videos done, pump them out, fit into the busy schedule. You know, my conference in New York, we had 200 people at the conference that I was chairing and, and hosting. Mm -hmm. And at lunchtime, I went up to my hotel room because so I gave it this private deck terrace area in the middle of Manhattan. It was pretty cool. So I recorded 10 videos during the lunch break of the conference up there. And if I had been worried about audio and having the tripod perfect, it wouldn't have turned out. But instead, I had you know, my iPhone in my hand and I was like swiveling around showing people, you know, the deck in, in New York. and. Um, you know, my, it was a little bit shaky, you know, but whatever, it's got it done, and the content was valuable, so I, I don't worry about the production as much as some people do. Yeah, but you see, this is uh, what a lot of people say these days, at least I've, I've been told to, to, to follow this advice, is that the important, what people are looking for is authenticity. 
So they're not, they're not, they're, they're sick and tired of people in a perfect studio with perfectly coiffured hair and everything and makeup in the case right. of women and whatnot and really dressed well. They, they don't want that. They want real people. And so the fact that right. you're recording on a balcony and, and, and there's a bit of wind in the background and that, but you're a real person and people trust right. real people more than they trust the, the, the coiffured blonde girl on, on Fox News or whatever. So I, I think, I think that's, that, that's very clever what you've done there. And again, it, it costs you really, really little to do that. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. I think um, that also, you know, it just comes down to the necessity of if you want to produce a lot of content, articles or videos, you can't stress over the small details too much. Like, I never go and edit a video. If I mess up something royally, then I'll just delete the video, start over. It was just a two or three minute, you know, waste of time, and I'll start the video over. But that might happen once out of ten videos I record. Yeah. And otherwise, I'm just recording the video. Might look it down at a couple bullet points to the right before I start the video, or in the middle of it if I have to. But otherwise, I'm just saying, uh, you know, if I stumble, then I just correct myself and keep going. Just like if you're in a normal conversation, you don't leave the room and come back and try to make it perfect. You know, you just move on, and, you know, it's just a normal human being talking to you. And I think that adds the uh, authenticity of it as well. Now, let's talk about investments. Now, you're obviously uh, dealing with a lot of these high net worth individuals and wealthy people around the world. Where are they putting their money now? Mm -hmm. Because we've seen the stock market crash over the last few weeks. Um, oil has gone down half what it was last year. Right. Where are these people putting their money? So I think that um, there's a saying that if you know one family office, you know one family office. And I think it's complete garbage. I think it's something that people say when they don't know how to answer a question okay. at a conference. You know, they'll be on the stage and someone will say, hey, you know, oh, well, you know, most family offices invest in real estate or apartment buildings, and then they'll give some, like, non-answer saying that all family offices are different. But the reality is there's different classifications of family offices, just like animals uh, being, you know, a hierarchy of humans and species and mm -hmm. knowing how they act within a certain you know, genealogical makeup. And so there are single-family offices and multi-family offices. But within the multifamily office world, you have the billion dollar plus and kind of the startup guys that are just small shops. In the single family office world, you have virtual family offices, which are very small single family offices. You have kind of medium sized, legitimate single family offices that may only focus on a private equity like strategy or only focus on one industry and just build one platform business. There's a family in Thailand that I featured in one of my books that is a billionaire family office. They've bought 63 businesses and they've never sold one. And they're just building this large agricultural consumer platform business. There's other families that take an endowment style and they diversify their investments to a very, very high degree and invest for the long term, but high diversity like an endowment fund. Mm -hmm. And then I think what's most common for the clients that we work with a lot, uh, you know, $1 billion plus single family office will typically take a percentage of their income or their, their assets, maybe put 10, 20, 30, 50% in an endowment style uh, portfolio, then they'll take the private equity side, focus on one to three industries, um, and basically build a few platform businesses, have a couple different options there, and then they'll have a good chunk focused on, on real estate as well, which may or may not be one of those three strategies. That's what I see most common, and it just depends on what type of family office you're talking about. I think if you talk generically, a lot of family offices invest in apartment buildings in Hong Kong and Eastern Europe and in Moscow. A lot of the families made their money in commercial real estate and a ton of the capital goes right back into commercial real estate. So that's really a common area. But another kind of default answer is that a lot of families invest back into where they made their money. And if they made their money in coal, then they're typically going to try to vertically integrate and create, you know, a coal asset with some real estate assets typically, you know, around it. Um, so I'd say those would be the answers that you can most accurately give in just a minute or two. But you literally could write a you know five hundred page book just on that one question you just asked because it could go set the beach trying to explain it. Well, as as Warren Buffett often says, he only invests in things that he knows. So it, it makes sense to invest in an industry that you know you, you know about because you, you won't you're more likely to not make a mistake than if you go and put your money into something that you don't know anything about. Also, I should imagine that most right. of them invest in things they're passionate about. Because again, if you're passionate about something, you know about it. And so you're, you're less likely to make mistakes. 
Right, right, that's true. I mean, if you are well known in your industry, mm -hmm. then you have so many different advantages. You know, you have an information advantage, uh, a resource advantage. You know who is in the industry that you need to work with to pull off a new business venture, for example, or to outshine your competitors with marketing. You've been there before. You have a deal flow advantage because people might know your name um, and they might show you a deal first if they know that you recently sold your business or that you've been a great success. So you'll see deals earlier uh, and you'll get better terms sometimes because people want to work with the Warren Buffett of their industry or the Bill Gates of their space because they're going to trust you're not going to back out of the deal at the last minute. They're going to trust that you're going to be treated right. You'll get a fair price, etc. So I think that there's a lot of advantages that families have by focusing on their own space that they lose if they try to move up the learning curve by going too aggressively into new areas they're not familiar with. Okay, now let's let's talk about continuous education because I should imagine sure. you're one of these people that keeps updating yourself. Uh, you're very cutting edge with social media, which is why your business is doing so well. So you're ahead of the game of most people in the, in the family office space. What do you do to continuously educate yourself? Um, in the past, I've followed some marketers that have changed how I think. Um, mm -hmm. Brian Tracy and Evan Pagan were a huge yeah. influences on me yeah. um, right before I started my business. Um, yeah, I know Brian. He, he endorsed my first book. So. Oh, really? He's okay. A good guy. Yeah. yeah, he's great. Uh, he's excellent. Um, I read his stuff all the time. I think reading the book uh, 50 Success Principles by uh, Jack Canfield um, mm -hmm. is something I've done every year uh, for the past seven years, and I think that's the best book anybody can read in terms of being a, a success business-wise because it'll mean something different to you yeah. every six months if you're doing anything in your business and grow fast. And so I think those, those people have been key, but along the way I've also studied um, you know, John Carlton and Joe Polish and Dean Jackson and uh, Dan Sullivan and Dan Kennedy, and um, I've bought every book ever written on the family office industry. There's about 30 of them, and studied those books uh, to learn more about my own industry. And then really I've looked, I think part of it is by absorbing the content from those individuals and realizing my model is to give so much value and everywhere within a little niche. So that if anybody tried to come along, even if they spent literally a million dollars, they couldn't replicate the infrastructure we brought uh, that we put together. Mm -hmm. And it would take 10,000 hours of work as well as, you know, a million dollars or two uh, to compete because there's so many thought leadership assets we put out there. I think that mindset uh, came from those marketers I just mentioned. And I think that every day we're building those walls higher to protect the turf that we operate on. And that mindset of looking at a niche like Coca-Cola looks at distributing their drink. You know, they sell Coca-Cola at the movie theater, at hotels, at Costco, grocery store, convenience store, the energy drink brand with an alternative clothing store. Like they, they have their drink for sale in every point of distribution possible where their clients go and they make up new points of distribution by putting a, a cooler energy drinks in the clothing store or something or putting a vending machine somewhere. And so I think that that's how we look at any niche. So when we look at the family and office industry, we have the podcast, the newsletter, the largest LinkedIn group, and on the website, the best-selling book, you know, a top conference business in the area. Mm -hmm. And we're building more doorways into our world. You know, if someone looks for executive search, they could meet us there. Even if they don't engage us, uh, we want to treat them with respect and value during that process. Mm -hmm. The next day, they might see that we have a book on the industry or a conference. And so we look at it as setting up a number of doorways to get introductions and build relationships with family offices. And by having distribution in all of those different channels, uh, we've got about 16 or 17 different ways for families to be engaging with us every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Okay, uh, Richard, it's been very, very interesting talking to you and having you on the show. Thank you very much. If people want to get hold of you, it's the, what's the best way to, to find you? Sure. Well, uh, you know, one thing I wanted to comment on, just because I think your question was about social media and being 100% on top of it, is I think that the real, you know, driving point on what I was saying is that it's not, for me, about studying social media uh, or studying marketing, using every new trick and every new, you know, light box pop-up or LinkedIn trick. I think it's more about the mindset of you want to be everywhere and always be protecting the turf more and always making those walls taller. And then by doing that, you're going to push the envelope 
on what you can do to gain more distribution and use social media in every way you can creatively think of to penetrate the niche further rather than the opposite, you know, finding a trick and trying to apply the trick to your business. It's like, how do I get more business market share? Yeah. Now I use social media for my needs the way I want to. So just to make sure that people didn't think I skipped your question, just went off on, you know, our business structure. It all comes back to our mindset and how we approach social media. But if anybody wanted to get in touch, um, the best place to go would just be familyoffices.com. Uh, my email is just richard at familyoffices.com. And you know, we pride ourselves in giving away a thousand times more than, and than what we charge for, really. So we're happy to be a helpful resource, provide feedback to anybody if they have questions on marketing or on the family office industry in general. Yeah, great. Okay, thank you very much for being on the show. Yeah, thank you.